On a recent episode of our Save the Extreme cast, we talked about economy systems in games and specifically live service slash games as a service kind of design. And I wanted to expand on the issue of power curves and how they relate to not only game design in general, but what it means to keep supporting a game with new content and all the headaches that come with it. When we traditionally use the term power curve in game design, it relates to the overall power that a character or player will achieve over the length of playing a game. It is an essential part of balancing the title. When you're trying to figure out how strong you want to make enemies, what kind of power or stats you want to give to gear or equipment, and is a major form of progressing through a game. For this first part of the video, we're going to spend a little bit more time on that. In the back half, we'll be talking more specifically about multiplayer and where it gets even harder to do. But when you're trying to figure out the power curve of your title, you need to be balancing this with everything else that's in your game. And it sounds a lot harder, or it is a lot harder than it sounds in this aspect. Because good game design is about giving the player a measured challenge. Shouldn't be too hard, shouldn't be too easy. And one of the problems that we see with games, especially those that are of the open world or featuring procedurally ran randomly generated loot, is how do you keep the player growing without you know stamping them into the ground because they didn't get a lucky drop? And this is a lot, again, it's a lot harder than it sounds. In Diablo, for instance, or in most ARPGs that feature procedurally generated gear, what they'll typically do is figure out essentially a spectrum in terms of how low and how high the relative power of gear should be at basically different level tiers. So we go like level 1 to 10, 10 to 15, maybe 16 to 20, and you'll notice in a lot of these games that when the player hits previously established level caps, usually in the base game versus when they add on to expansions, that jump is often very huge. So in Diablo 3, there is a noticeable spike in terms of gear power when you go from level 60 to 61 and then 69 to 70. And they do this as a way of kind of establishing these major thresholds in terms of what challenge a game is going to give you. And oftentimes these are met with additions of new gear, new types, enemy encounters, etc., etc. Now, while this certainly works, you need to be always thinking about what is the base progression of your game. And this is where it gets very tricky, especially if your game is uh, malleable or wide enough to accommodate side content, bonus areas, extra challenges, etc. and so on. Because if you make that stuff required, either implicitly by saying, oh, we're just going to bump every enemy up, and if you didn't already do all the side content, you're screwed, or explicitly by saying, oh, you're level 5? Well, you can't do this until you hit level 30 or 20 or whatever, then this can come back to hurt a game's experience. And we've seen this in a lot of open world style games and even MMOs where just by doing the basic content and the story major content of your game, you still can't progress and you'll have to do side content. And required optional content is not good. It may be safely extreme, but it's not good design. And you need to be careful about this. This is often why a lot of developers will essentially design their game in the matter of like two distinct ways. You have your base path for people who are just interested in the story. Let's say to beat the final boss of the main game, you must hit level 30 or whatever. Well, by playing the main game, you will accomplish that feat easily. Then they'll have side content that is balanced a lot higher and requiring more skill and more content to go through. So the optional boss fight may be level 50 and 60, and you'll have to do that side content. 
what you want to be careful of in these games is you don't want to invalidate the content that's in your game, whether by making it so little that the player can't do it, or you put so high up on a pedestal that most people other than maybe the 5% of your uber expert players will ever accomplish it. The goal is you want to move as many players as you can through the content of your title. And that is a topic in of itself. And that gets at progression curves and the gameplay loop that we don't have the time to get to today. But when we often talk about open world gameplay, we see those issues. I know not the last Assassin's Creed, you know, I think the one before it got dinged by people for having a, I think it was like a paid experience booster that you could spend on in a retail game in order to make it easier to progress. Some people argued, well, I just did all the side content and it didn't bother me, but that's a problem. Again, you do not want to force people to do optional content. You want that stuff to be icing on the cake, not, again, the vegetables you have to eat to get back to the good stuff. And the good stuff means different things depending upon how somebody plays a game, and that will be another topic about motivation. But we're going to take a quick break now, and when we come back, we're going to switch things over from single player to multiplayer, and how games such as Gwent up there, Hearthstone, League of Legends, and pick any live service game often struggle with this idea of continued and ever-growing power in their titles. And now for a quick thank you to our current Patreon supporters. And if you're interested in my books on design, they are available at most major retailers. 20 Essential Games to Study is for first-time developers looking to be inspired. And the Game Design Deep Dive series covers the history and philosophy of major genres, with horror coming later in 2021. Alright, so in the last part, we focus more on single-player progression in terms of a power curve. But now it's time to get to the nasty and the more complicated part when it comes to multiplayer. Unfortunately, we don't play a lot of multiplayer or gotcha-focused games on stream, so I don't have a lot of footage to go for. If you guys want me to spend like two hours opening up loot boxes sometime, let me know. But power curve in multiplayer games is very hard to do right. And there are two distinct areas you have to focus on as a developer. The first is simply numbers. And as we said in the last part, power or number-based progression is a can lead to this like endless scale. Or it can become a challenge of knowing just how to put even level players together. Now in multiplayer-based games, number progression or power progression along these lines can lead to imbalances and players just being between a rock and a hard place in terms of trying to win. And with live service titles that add in new content, that often leads to more power being added. If month one, the strongest weapon in the game does 500 points of damage, month two, it could be 525 or 550. And this just keeps getting scaled up and up. And it's pushing down all the older content in the process. Now, we can argue that skill can trump numbers in this aspect, but it only goes so far. If you give the best player in the game a weapon that does 3 points of damage, and you give somebody else one that does 800 points of damage, well, it doesn't really matter about skill at that point. And oftentimes, this can lead into an arms race situation with, with consumers trying to outdo one another for any semblance of advantage. It could even be as simple as just saying, this weapon has 10 more points of damage, or it fires 3 milliseconds faster. Because again, at the highest of the high level, Grandmaster play in a game, this is where any advantage is heavily scrutinized. And why it becomes, especially for esports titles, very important to keep an even hand in this aspect. Now, the problem, as we've said, is that 
as you go longer or further into in terms of live service, you need to do something to keep the player invested with new content. And we'll come back to that at the very end of this section. But when it comes to power along these lines, typically you either have to go all in and kind of embrace this and say, you know, every three months we're going to raise the max power curve of our game, or you have to keep things very even. This is what we see in a lot of deck builders where mana costs will stay very consistent and developers will keep the power with, between those mana points on a set standard. Now with that said, that takes us to the next point about a power curve in multiplayer games and that is uniqueness. And what we mean by this is by adding in new or special powers, move sets, mechanics, whatever, to give cards or characters new options. This is incredibly po uh, popular when it comes to hero-focused games, gotchas, and so on. Because yes, everybody can be the same number-wise in terms of attack and defense, but if character A has some unique power that nobody else can get, suddenly that character is a lot more popular or it becomes a lot more in terms of utility. And like I said, gotcha games will do this extremely. The ones that I've played, their SSR or, you know, super rare characters will often have unique abilities or functionality that nobody else can get. That's part of the draw and that becomes part of the balance. And this has a far greater shelf life compared to just power because a unique ability cannot be measured as easy as just saying i do six points of damage you do four points of damage ergo i'm better but if you have something that says let's say this character gets lifesteal and nobody else can do that suddenly they're a lot more popular in terms of keeping them around longer. Now, with that said, as I'm sure most of you are about to point out, there are some very big balance issues when we talk about this. First is just how great is that new power? Because that will greatly affect the popularity and the value of said character. Also, are or is that power shared in different aspects with other characters in your game? Because let's say with the lifesteal example that six other characters have lifesteal, maybe not as strong, but they still have that option, then, they, then that value is reduced. And what we often see in, well, with hero collectors or uh, deck building style games is that a power may remain unique to a specific faction or a specific kind of card. But again, you run that risk of saying if this is so good that nobody else can compete with it, then it becomes a false choice and it breaks the meta of your game. Now, another issue when it comes to this is what happens over the length of playing a game in terms of new features and abilities. This is a problem that deck builders and games that get constant support will run into. When you only have, let's say, 30 characters or 60 cards, yes, having four or five of them being unique can help and stand out. But when your game goes on for months or years and you now have 300 characters or 800 cards, what happens to all those cards that were there at the very beginning? And... That's an issue that Hearthstone has certainly had in spades. If you have two cards, a they're both mana 3, attack, defense 3-3, three, three, but one card has no special effect, and another card will cause the enemy to discard one card in their hand when you play it, which card is the better option? I think we all know the answer to that. And that's the problem. We see this in hero collectors and MOBAs and games along those lines, that the champions and characters that are there for year one are just woefully behind stuff that was added six months, two years, three years, however you want to say in the future.
And that in of itself is not bad. Part of the part of this kind of growth we see in live service games is the very fact that as the developers become more comfortable with the design and maybe they add in new people onto the design team who have their own fresh ideas, you get crazy new abilities and special things that nobody ever thought of during year one. Warframe has been an example of that as well. But again, it puts an expiration date on your older content. If you have a character year one who does nothing unique, it's just a common soldier everyone want to say, why should anyone take that two to three years down the line? And gotcha games are very suspect or very guilty of this as well. There are some that are five, six years running with dozens if not hundreds of characters to collect. And even their SSR or their UR or everyone say their highest rank is, there are characters that are just worthless because they were there at the beginning and they don't have anywhere near the same functionality that the newer stuff has. And this is a hard problem to solve because of it. Because uniqueness is certainly higher value or higher praise than just power. But you need to concern yourself with how that relates to everything else in your game. And I know very surely that a few of you watching this are designing your own multiplayer based games or your own deck builders. I'm sure somebody is very much watching who's doing just that right now. And it is something you need to consider with these games. Is what is the extent of your long term play? What will your game look like six months from now? Three years from now? While we're not saying you need to be designing that far in advance, you need to be thinking about what that or what your game is going to be like and what your content is going to be like down the line. And that takes me to our final point. You need to think about when it comes to adding content or raising power uniqueness, what is the rate of that? Because tell me, how many of you right now design a game think you could design a unique mechanic for a new character every week for your game for the next three years? Right now, I'm sure a few of you may be hyperventilating at that question that I just asked. And I'm sorry, this is not the horror video. But you need to be thinking about what is going to be the timetable for this content. And you need to flesh that out to your consumer base. Because your consumer base needs to know what your game is going to look like. One of the games that I'm playing right now on mobile kind of hasn't had any major or game-changing updates in the last few months, and people are getting bored of that. If your game is focused on new cards, or new story content, or new missions, or new maps, people need to know when to expect that stuff. And it's hard. Again, live service games come with a lot of reward when they blow up, but there's a lot of risk in designing a game that you're going to, have to keep that updated on a consistent schedule for the foreseeable future. And the games that tend to fail in this aspect don't have a plan. They don't understand that people expect new stuff. And in many videos and many pieces, we've talked about the idea of user-generated content as a way of supplementing it. But that is beyond the scope of this video. So with that said, to wrap things up, power curves are an essential part of understanding the progression of your game, whether it's single player, multiplayer, live service, whatever. And you have to be thinking about where the player is going to be growing over the course of playing this game. If they're not able to keep up with your content, whether it's because of progression in terms of loot or in terms of loot boxes or getting new stuff, they're going to become very frustrated. And good game design is about balancing that out. I've played mobile and gacha games that will purposely introduce difficulty spikes at specific parts of their campaign to kind of force the player to go down the gacha or loot box route. It's very manipulative, and 
if people aren't fooled by that or they get annoyed, they're going to stop playing. And when it comes to uniqueness, that that is definitely an attractive option. And when it works well, it keeps people invested far longer than just chasing numbers. But as we've said over the course of the section, it is a lot harder to do this over the long term without breaking your older content or introducing that game breaking one or that game, you know, destroying one. Because you have to look at how balance works. People will decry that anything new is irreverently just broken. But you need to understand the difference between something that is so good because nobody has come with a proper counter to it, or something that's so good because there is no proper counter to it. And that comes with play testing and watching the consumers, you know, absorb and just tear apart that new card or that new champion. So with all that said, my question for you watching. Can you think of games that handled their power curve really well? And can you think of some that other than ones that we mentioned here that completely wrecked it? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, if you'd like to suggest a topic for a future video, let me know in the comments or uh, join the Game Wisdom Discord. As always, you'll find links to all that in the description down below and come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where he's in the art and science of games.